Thank you so much for being here. You're one of our favorite presenters. <laughs> And uh, what I what I love so much about what you do is, um, you know, soil is kind of that unforgotten. It's like it's a, that forgotten resource. Um, and you bring to life why it's so important that we think about our soil and that we think about soil as a biodiverse system, because I think that people don't always know that. So um, I appreciate you being here um, today and you're one of our favorites. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn my mute, my mic off because they don't want to hear me. They want to hear you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, it's really an honor to be here with you all. I always uh, look forward to this uh, time of year and a chance to share this. Um, I'm Elizabeth Bach. I am a scientist. I work uh, with uh, organization called the Nature Conservancy um, here in the state of Illinois. I'm based at a preserve in north central Illinois called Nechusa Grasslands. Um, so if you happen to be in northern Illinois, uh, we are open to the public. You're welcome to come visit. If not, um, we have a website. Check us out. Um, it's a great place to be. And the science I do uh, really is bridges the on the ground conservation work we do to protect um, biodiversity um, in Illinois where I live, um, but also really actively engaged with the science, asking questions. And then today I'm going to talk a lot about how um, the work I do also uh, works at a global level, talking with colleagues around the world and thinking about soil biodiversity um, around the world. So uh, to get started, um, I'm going to ask you all a couple questions first, and I think you'll be able to type your answers in the Q&A box um, just to get a little interaction going this morning. When I say the word dirt, what do you think of? In YouTube, we have somebody writing um, dark. Mm. Uh, we have somebody writing um, dead. All right. That's a really good one. Um, and then for our attendees, you would use the Q&A box at the bottom. There's a feature there at the bottom of your screen, Q&A, and I apologize. I forgot to tell everyone that. So if you're just joining us, uh, Ms. Bach has a request of you. We want to repeat it in the Q and A, yeah. sir. Sure. So we're just gonna we're just getting started this morning. I know for some of you it's probably early in the morning. Uh, when you hear the word dirt, what do you think about? This is uh, just a little interaction to help us all uh, get going before um, I dive into a, a more formal presentation. So what do you think of when you hear the word dirt? And you can type that in the Q&A or um, in, the, in the YouTube as well. And so far we've heard uh, dark or dead as, as connotations for the word. Um, I see worms and mud pies coming in through the uh, Q&A. Uh, these are all really great uh, associations. I'll give it just a few more seconds in case anybody else wants to jump in um, and then we'll move on. Well, you can keep thinking on that. I think these are some really great responses uh, for the word dirt. So I'm going to ask one more word association, and that's soil. What do you think about when you hear the word soil? On Facebook, they said dirt. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's a good one. I see garden in the Q&A here. All 
right. Um, I'll give it just a few more seconds if there's any other thoughts on what people think of when they hear the word soil. Um, and you can type those in. And the reason I like to always start here in terms of asking what we think about when we hear dirt and what we hear soil is that as, as some of you have mentioned, we often think of them as uh, the same thing. They're interchangeable usually in how we use them in our daily life. Um, but there is a subtle difference. Um, and the biggest difference is life. So whoever uh, wrote dead for dirt really gets the gold star for this morning. Um, the difference is dirt is just debris and soil can actually support life. Um, it can grow plants and it can support organisms in the soil. And that's really the uh, dictionary difference between dirt and soil. And so most of us that study soil, it's really important that we use the word soil because that's the life part of it um, as opposed to the dirt part of it. Um, and so I'm gonna ask one more question for some uh, free responses. And that's when, uh, when you think about life in the soil, what do you think about? Are there critters? Are there things they're doing? What just comes to your mind um, off the top of your head? And you can type those into the chats or the Q&A um, and we'll see what we get from the audience. On YouTube, we have bacteria, fungus, insects, roots. Awesome, those are all great, all awesome things that do live in the soil. Great, well, um, you can keep thinking. It's okay to keep typing things in um, as we kind of roll through this. Um, I'm also gonna mention if you have questions that come up while I'm talking, feel free to go ahead and put those in the Q&A or the chat boxes or the uh, comment sections on whatever platform you're using. Um, and I'll try and um, answer those as we, as we go through the presentation. I've tried to keep the slides short so we can have more of a conversation today. So yeah, what lives in soil? The truth is soil is home to more than 25% of all described species on earth. It's really an important habitat for life on Earth. And um, as we mentioned at the top of the hour, we don't often think about that. It's not always the top of our mind when we think about biodiversity. And so um, things like earthworms and centipedes and millipedes and ants um, and termites are often what we uh, think about when we think about life in soil because those are the things that are big enough to see. But we also have microscopic organisms like bacteria and fungi and roundworms like nematodes um, that are really important in the soil and require uh, some different ways to look at them using microscopes or um, advanced molecular tools. And today I want to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the work I've been doing with soil biodiversity that's kind of come together um, this year. Soil critters are gaining attention worldwide. And just last month, or last December, I guess that was two months ago now, um, on World Soil Day, which happens to be December 5th, so mark your calendars, December 5th, World Soil Day, um, the United Nations released the first ever global synthesis on the state of knowledge of soil biodiversity. Um, and this is a really big deal. This is something that's never been done before. And I had the honor to be one of the lead chapter authors on this report. Um, and it's, um, anyway, today I wanna walk through kind of the five W's, the who, what, when, where, why, and what we're gonna do how as well, of uh, what this report was, how we pulled it together and why it's so important um, in our world. So I'm actually gonna start with the why, because I personally always like to know why should I care about this before someone launches into telling me everything about it? So um, global uh, biodiversity is in decline as uh, probably many of you know, if you uh, signed up to tune into this kind of a webinar, but soil biodiversity has never been considered explicitly in global conversations around how to protect biodiversity and uh, reverse this decline. And um, the organization globally where a lot of those conversations happen is uh, within the United Nations. It's called the Convention on Biological Diversity. 
And what this means is it's, it's a network of uh, really policy leaders and diplomats from nations around the world who focus on biodiversity issues and thinking about how we as humanity, as a global society can um, live in harmony with biodiversity and support biodiversity as well as uh, human health and well-being. And every 10 years, this Convention on Biological Diversity has a really big meeting where they um, kind of put together the goals and agenda to, for the next 10 years of work around biodiversity. And this winter, the winter of 2020, 2021, is when that conversation is happening. So those of us in the soil community were really um, motivated to be at the table for these conversations. And this is really the realm of what we call science and policy. Um, scientists like myself talking to uh, folks who actually uh, have sway in setting policy at local, national, or even um, multinational levels. So this story actually starts um, way back in 2011 after the last uh, big conference uh, convention on biological diversity and uh, team soil uh, got together colleagues from around the world and said we we need a seat at the table we need to be considered um, along with above ground biodiversity and so there's been a lot of work over 10 years um, including uh, from multiple organizations to give a voice to soil biodiversity and to advocate for soil biodiversity to be considered in these big discuss discussions and agendas. And in 2018, the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, decided that, or requested a global synthesis, or a global report on soil biodiversity to be done in time for it to be considered in these conversations for the post-2020 biodiversity framework. So that's a little bit of the why and what's going on in the background. Who, who are these people? Who are these scientists? Um, these are scientists that are part of organizations including the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative where I worked for several years uh, before taking my current position. Uh, the European Commission has a strong uh, soils research lab that uh, really is involved in these conversations uh, deeply. Something called the Global Soil Partnership and the Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils. Um, so the Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils is similar to, some of you may have heard of the um, Intergovernmental um, Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, that does a big report every five to 10 years. This is kind of the soil version of that. We're a bit smaller, but we're trying to do the same thing, synthesize the um, science, the cutting edge science from around the world to really understand soil and its conditions. Um, part of the trick is these organizations like the Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils are really skewed towards soil chemists and soil physicists, and the biologists haven't had as much space. So these other organizations like the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative are working together with these groups to bring more biologists into these important conversations. And this resulted in over 300 scientists from around the world collaborating to write this single report. Um, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, but it was a lot of work, a lot of uh, trying to coordinate people from a lot of different places uh, to write about the most cutting edge science and what we really know about soil biodiversity. Uh, so to touch on the when, now, these conversations are happening right now. This report was written to be part of it and um, soil biodiversity, we're really excited to see it uh, having a space uh, in these conversations and where it's everywhere on earth where uh, soil biodiversity is important to all of us in all of our neighborhoods. So what does this report say? What is the state of soil biodiversity? So um, the key things here kind of synthesize what we know about soil biodiversity. Soil organisms decompose dead plants and recycle nutrients. So we have things like ants and termites and earthworms that are tearing apart dead leaves and stems and tissues on the surface and bringing them into the soil. We have bacteria and fungi that are interacting uh, with this partially decomposed stuff in the soil and really breaking it down to those elemental components that living plants need. So without this activity by these soil organisms, we wouldn't have plants, things wouldn't decompose, our world would not uh, function the way it does. And these processes, um, lead to things like being able to grow food, um, to clean water, uh, to contribute to human health and well-being in numerous ways. And this report goes through and really details 
point by point how all of those things are achieved by soil biodiversity and how protecting soil biodiversity is important to continuing uh, those services. And then another key uh, component of the report is uh, looking at scientific advances. Um, our, we have new analyses and technology that allow us to think about uh, soil communities in their entirety, not just a single organism at a time. And we're beginning to understand how the interactions between these organisms, which is kind of depicted in this, I know somewhat overwhelming graphic I have here, um, are really contributing to ecosystems and how they function. Uh, both for wildlife and um, nature, as well as ways that we as humans benefit from it. So this actually sets us up to realize we're in a position where we can leverage soil organisms uh, to improve things like food production or to uh, reclaim degraded soils or break down pollution. And, and I have an image here from the report that's showing two organisms organisms uh, that probably some of you have heard of, it, heard of and maybe some of you haven't, um, that are really kind of flagship characters for these activities. Um, here on the left, I'm gonna try and use my pointer, hopefully you can see this, uh, we have a zoom in on rhizobium and rhizobium are bacteria. They live in the soil, but they form these relationships with particular plants, uh, plants that are legumes or members of the Fabaceae family. Um, these would be things like beans um, or um, I'm trying to think other examples um, are uh, dogwood tree or not dogwoods, redbud trees are actually um, legumes as well. Anyway, all of these legumes produce these root nodules. So the plant actually forms a little home for these bacteria and the bacteria live there and these bacteria fix nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is one of the most important things for plants as well as um, animals like ourselves that we need to produce uh, muscle tissue or organs. Plants need it for leaves. Plants need it to do photosynthesis. Nitrogen is important in all of these components. And it's uh, can be a little bit difficult to get from the environment. So these plants and bacteria have formed a partnership to really leverage that nutrient um, acquisition. And that's something that plants rely on soil organisms to do. Another example of these kind of partnerships between soil communities and uh, kind of the above ground component we see on a daily basis are mycorrhizae fungi. So these are fungi, not bacteria. They live in the soil and they also can form these relationships with plants. Uh, but they usually form kind of a, oh, uh, it's more like a revolving door with a plant cell where the fungi are really good at exploring the soil and picking up nutrients um, like phosphorus and nitrogen, and then bringing that up into the plant. And in turn, the plant gives the fungi energy um, that they produce through photosynthesis. This is kind of like giving candy bars in exchange for protein is what's happening um, between these organisms. So again, they live in partnership and it works for all of them. We also know that a lot of bacteria and fungi in the soil can actually break down pollutants, things like heavy metals or um, organic molecules that are used for pesticides or um, other components. And then kind of the last big take home point here is that soils and their biodiversity are being degraded and they need to be protected. And so I'm gonna walk through this. I know it's a bit overwhelming. Um, the report was meant to be read, not <laughs> so much on a PowerPoint. So I, I know this is a bit much, but things like deforestation or uh, agricultural intensification where um, areas are cleared and converted into intensive row crop agriculture all contribute to soil degradation through erosion and by shifting uh, these soil communities. Uh, shifting nutrient balances can also have major impacts as can acidification. Um, that can happen through acid rain or uh, fertilizer input can often cause acidification. And all of these things just shift the balances of how these soil organisms are interacting. And uh, they can cause some negative um, uh, outcomes. Salinization, that's the process where soils uh, actually get more salty. Um, and that's usually in areas where there's really high evaporation. So kind of hot, dry environments where maybe uh, there's some irrigation and water's going in. Um, and of course, pollution, which I just mentioned. Uh, soil uh, biodiversity both can be impacted by pollution, but can also be a solution to pollution. 
And then compaction, uh, activity like walking or driving um, can lead to that. Urbanization in uh, soil sealing, uh, which is where you pave over soils or you build things on soils and now that soil's not functioning biologically. Um, and it's not to say, it, you know, there's a balance in all of these things. We need places to live. We need uh, cities. We need roads to get around. But the trick is to just think about it holistically and think about how can we do this together with soil um, and be thoughtful about where we build and how we build. Um, and then, of course, things like uh, wildfire, um, erosion and landslides, like the big um, glacier landslide we saw in India just earlier this week. Um, and then loss of organic matter. And this organic matter is actually, when it's um, lost, it's respired as carbon dioxide where it contributes to climate change. And the converse is if we can build those pools, we can actually mitigate climate change. So soil's at the interface of all of these environmental challenges. And it's a really unique opportunity to address multiple challenges through single actions or a suite of actions that make sense. So I'm going to, uh, kind of wrap up today and talk about the how. How can we make a difference for soil biodiversity and our world? Um, and the first how uh, really comes from this report and it's geared because this report was made for um, politicians. Um, it's a little more policy oriented. And this is the kind of work that I get to do with colleagues, which is uh, working with politicians to enact policies that support biodiversity. How can we protect soils from development or be thoughtful about how development happens? How can we uh, support ecosystem restoration where it's feasible to actually improve soil biodiversity and how those ecosystems function? How can we encourage ag agricultural management that leverages soil biodiversity to produce food? And that can look really different in different kinds of agricultural production, um, depending on what part of the world you live in. Um, and urban planning that again, you know, we need places to live, we need cities. We can think about our urban spaces through the lens of soil biology and how they can help both mediate the impacts of urban areas, but also provide valuable things like green spaces and parks that we all enjoy spending time at. And to come down to a little more, um, I don't know, local level, um, what can we do? What can you all do um, as students or people in your own backyards or in your neighborhoods? Uh, what are ways that we can contribute uh, beyond this big arena of global policy? Uh, we can spend time in parks and natural areas, maybe take a magnifying glass with you and, and take a close look at the soil. Um, maybe not when it's as snowy as it is where I live right now, but um, you know, you'll be surprised what you can see. You might just start learning more about those different kinds of organisms. Clean your shoes when you move around to different areas to prevent spreading invasive species. Um, there's several species of earthworms that are invasive um, as well as um, pests to uh, plants and, and animals. And it's important to help prevent those from moving around too rapidly. Leaving dead leaves um, on your lawn or in your local park or lawn clippings um, is another great way. That really just feeds the soil uh, organisms and let them do what they do. And they'll take care of it for you. Um, those dead leaves will be gone by spring um, if you leave them in the fall. Uh, plant native plants if you have an opportunity to do so or volunteer at a natural area work day. And I know this varies depending on where you live in your neighborhood, um, but keep an eye out. There may be opportunities. And another really important thing we can all do is learn more about soil biodiversity and what it means. Um, and a great way to do that is to look at this resource called the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas. Um, and this came out a couple of years ago, uh, but it's still the go-to resource to learn about soil biodiversity. It has beautiful photos and illustrations. You can access it online for free at this website, and I can share this uh, directly uh, with you all as well. Um, and if you're a teacher or a librarian and you want a print copy for a classroom or something, you can order a print copy of this. Um, it, it's printed by the European Commission, so you do have to pay shipping from Europe, but it comes out to about 40 bucks overall. So it's, it's a pretty decent um, deal for the type of book it is. Um, and this was uh, a book put together, again, by a lot of the same scientists that wrote this global policy report. So this is kind of the learning edition and the global so, uh, policy report is more of the uh, policy engagement. So I'm gonna quit talking now and let you all talk and ask questions. Um, and 
anything is fair game. Ask me about soil, ask me about the report, or ask me about my job and how uh, what my day to day looks like. I'm happy to answer uh, questions. Wow, those are populating in uh, in our Q and A in the webinar. Um, I did want to. I heard from some teachers who were signed up from Kentucky, Tennessee area, and apparently a nice storm rolled through, and their Wi Fi <laughs> to their buildings is not working. So I recorded. Don't worry, we'll get it to them. But um, at any rate, um, one of these questions you answered, but maybe you could do in more detail. There is a question from YouTube: Are it, um, are there invasive species in soil? There are. Okay, go ahead. She's oh, okay. there. <laughs> yeah, and that's a great question. And it's one we don't think about that often. But yeah, um, in some parts of the world, there's some pretty invasive species of earthworms. Um, so where I live in kind of uh, the upper part of North America, um, probably our most common earthworm um, isn't native to our area, the Lumbris terrestris. Um, and that is, it, you know, it's, it's come along with people as people have moved around the world. Uh, there's also some invasive earthworms that some folks may have heard of, um, the jumping worms um, that are uh, making their way in some parts of the world. And we get um, flatworms in places like Brazil and the UK that are also um, invasive species. Uh, those are kind of the ones that we we think about the most. There's also things like invasive uh, springtails or columbula. Those are really uh, cute little organisms. And usually these don't get the same attention that, you know, an invasive plant or animal gets because uh, in one sense, we're used to them being here. They've been here for about, you know, 100, 150 years, uh, but they do make some really big impacts on ecosystems. They really transform how things decompose and how quickly that happens. Um, so it is something that we don't want to spread them around if we know how to prevent that. Um, Perfect. Um, and you followed up. I was going to give a follow up, but you, you got it. Um, can you fix compaction? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it can be fixed. It does take a bit of effort and it depends on uh, the level of compaction. So compaction from, say, uh, tractor tires in a farm field, that can uh, that can be reversed sometimes um, just by uh, planting, like letting plant roots uh, go to town or uh, actually doing some tillage to break up that compaction layer. In other places, uh, compaction can be a bigger issue where um, maybe there's sometimes there's a subsoil that uh, compacts to a greater degree than the topsoil. And what happens is water can't infiltrate through that compaction zone and it starts moving horizontally and you get landslides, you get flooding, you get lots of negative problems. Those can be harder to um, reverse. They often require um, some pretty intense kind of engineering, heavy machinery work. Uh, but there are machines out there that can kind of dig basically a giant knife blade through the soil and help break that up. And if you can kind of start to break that up and then plant, um, you want plants that are going to be there long-term perennial plants. Um, in some places, trees are a good example, are a good way to do this. that are going to send roots down and really break up that compaction zone. So depending on how severe the compaction is or what um, the desire is to shift it, there are things that can be done to reverse that. Yeah. All right. Um, I got a message actually from Facebook. It's saying, um, it's asking um, about urban brownfields and, and it's a very long thing, um, but basically, um, you know, they're living in, a, in an area um, of, a, of an urban area and they're trying to set up gardens. And, yeah. You know, they're wondering about the urban. Okay, so you, you, you understand. Yeah, this is a really great question. Um, and this is, you know, it's a really challenging thing um, because a lot of those brown fields in urban areas, they have a lot of heavy metals or pollutants from those industries that um, either have been in the area or have been depositing waste in those areas. And part of the trick there is those things, um, if they wind up in plants that you plan to eat, like vegetables from a community garden or something, they can be dangerous to people. So you want to be really careful. And in a lot of those situations, um, either you're going to look at options to, to plant green things that aren't going to be eaten. Um, and that can be a good thing because a lot of those plants can actually, in some cases, accumulate those heavy metals and those pollutants. Um, and as long as you're not um, 
consuming those plants uh, directly, that can be a good way to help actually pull those out of the soil. The trick is that it still winds up in the plants, so you, you do have to be aware of that. Um, in a place where they may be trying to do a community garden where the goal is you want to eat some of that, um, really what you want to look at is a raised bed situation where you can partition off that more polluted soil and bring in um, topsoil for a raised bed to, to grow those, those uh, plants. Um, and that's because um, you, don't, you, you, want, you don't want those pollutants and heavy metals to wind up in, in food that people may be eating. Um, yeah, and there's plenty of people out there doing some really great work with brownfields that um, can also offer, uh, you know, additional insight and some of the resources The Atlas has a whole section about that, um, that you can, you can read in more detail. But uh, yeah, that's, those are, those are important areas. And they're areas that um, there's, there are some opportunities and ways to leverage soil biodiversity to help make those um, safer and, and healthier places uh, for people in uh, wildlife. So now I'm curious, I have two follow-up questions to that. Um, if over time, with the, with, if, you, if you planted plants above a brownfield and left, you know, over generation to generation, could they eventually pull most mm -hmm. of the plants out? And then um, I think I read somewhere that, that you, that there are bacteria that break down every contaminant in this way. Okay. Yeah, so um, yeah, so if you are able to plant, and sometimes it can be difficult, there's not, uh, you have to think a little bit about plants that can live in those kinds of environments. So you often end up with a plant community that's um, perhaps not entirely what uh, would have been there, you know, historically or, or native plants, but they're plants that can handle those conditions. They'll accumulate those plants and over time, um, that will kind of naturally break down and, and pull those out and, and kind of rehabilitate or what we call reclaim those soils. Um, and the other question was about, oh, uh, bacteria that can break down uh, those harmful things. Um, I'm not sure I would say that we know that they can break down every harmful um, chemical component, but um, there's a lot of bacteria out there that are able to break things down and, and every I know every week we're learning about new ones that can break different kinds of compounds down. So there's a lot of potential there for sure. And there's plenty of people working on how to um, supplement or amplify those parts of, of bacterial communities uh, to help do that. And, and one example, I'll, I, I wanna get to as many questions as I can, but a really um, clear example of that is sometimes in areas that I'm aware of where it, it may have been a former munitions area or um, there's some heavy, um, contaminants that are known in the soil, they may uh, create a shallow lake in that area. And what that does is actually shifts that um, soil sediment environment to what we call anoxic. So it's flooded with water, so oxygen doesn't move through it very well. And that actually creates an environment that selects for bacteria that thrive in those anoxic conditions. And a lot of those bacteria are able to break down those really complicated pollutants in a way that bacteria that are more accustomed to um, fully oxygenated environments don't. And so that's actually a passive way that is actively used um, throughout the world to shift a soil community to one that can actively break down these uh, chemical pollutants that may be known in areas. And I can think of several um, areas that are now uh, wildlife refuges where that was the approach uh, to, to rehabilitate that system. That is so cool. I did, I did not know about that. Um, and so then I have one more follow-up question. Sorry to be hugging up the follow-up questions. Um, what, um, so then in these areas that are polluted, is the biodiversity I assume is, is lower or can some- Yeah, that's a really good question. So generally it is lower uh, because fewer things are able to tolerate those conditions. And so it, you know, it's, it's just a selecting force um, and you usually end up with a, with a narrower community, one that, that can thrive in that. Um, what it really does is, you know, it shifts that community. So you're probably losing some components of that community that you may be amplifying or gaining other components. Um, so it's one of those, sometimes it's hard to say if overall diversity actually changes, but it certainly shifts that community. And usually um, it uh, reduces the total number of, of species you might see in that system. From uh, YouTube, what can I do in my yard 
um, to promote healthy soil? That is a great question. So one of the things I mentioned is leaving dead leaves in the fall if you're in a temperate area, um, uh, letting those decompose naturally, um, you know, thoughtfully using some mulch around areas. Uh, something I do in my yard is uh, in my flower beds or my garden, I'll put newspaper down and then I actually save leaves in the fall and then put those leaves on like a mulch layer, maybe a couple inches thick. And that really helps reduce the weeds because I don't want to spend all summer weeding my garden. Uh, <laughs> but it also just kind of acts as uh, this natural, it's a buffet for these soil organisms. And as they break down those leaves and that newspaper, they release those nutrients uh, so that those plants I'm trying to grow can use them. So that's a, that's a really great way to kind of work with the system. Um, you know, that being said, I, you know, you still may need to add some extra uh, uh, nutrients for your plants, depending on what you're growing. Um, you know, another great thing to do is, you know, if you mow, um, mow at, you know, a higher level, um, leave the grass clippings in place, those soil organisms are really going to go to town. Again, it's feeding lunch, it's feeding them lunch. Um, I always say feed the biodiversity, soil biodiversity, so it can feed you. Um, if you have an opportunity, plant some native plants in your backyard, that can be a really great thing too. Um, and a lot of areas will have either a native plant society or uh, some uh, groups that can help you connect with uh, places to get native plants uh, to put in your backyard. Um, and that helps, you know, insects and above ground critters too. It's really a win-win on both fronts. Um, if you're if you and your family are into it, composting is another thing you can do that just it's food waste that you're going to throw away. You let things like worms and bacteria break it down and then you can spread that on your plants and help them grow as well. Um, and if you have, you know, depending on the size of your yard or your neighborhood, actually choosing not to mow all of the yard can be a good choice. You want to be thoughtful there um, because you want to support uh, native plants that are going to grow, um, plants that aren't going to be, you know, a concern to your neighbors. Um, but, you know, we don't necessarily have to mow all of our yards. Uh, sometimes there's opportunities to either put more flower beds in or leave areas unmowed, and, and that can be an option too. Awesome. Um, how long, I, you might have actually talked about this, but um, how long does it take for us, for soil to form? Great question. Yeah. And this has been a really hot topic recently. So generally, um, we say soil formation, you get about, um, I think, a centimeter a century. So it's pretty slow process. Um, now, some, uh, sometimes if you're intentionally adding a lot of compost or, um, you know, sometimes people call this green manure plants that you would grow up and then kind of chop off and leave on the soil layer to decompose, you can build up kind of that compost organic layer pretty fast. Um, and the trick is that has to incorporate with the mineral component of soil. So soil has both this living component, this kind of decomposed dead material we call humus, and um, the weathered rock material. Um, and when you get that all kind of well mixed together, um, that rate of development is usually uh, very slow. Like I said, about a centimeter per century. Um, do you have a favorite soil? I love that question. And then a favorite soil organism. Okay, great. So my favorite soil is actually called a Smurfasol. And it is a blue oxic soil. Um, it's found in certain parts of Minnesota. Uh, and it just, it's uh, a soil that's in a particular zone where there's not a lot of oxygen and the reactions in the mineral component of that soil produce a real bluish hue. So they call it a Smurfasol. Uh, my favorite soil organism is probably the mycorrhizal fungi. I spent a lot of time thinking about those. I think they're so cool. They're kind of super highways that connect plants underground. They're transporting um, nutrients and water throughout the soil, kind of redistributing everything. And they're connecting plants together. Um, you know, and there's some communication networks there. So I just think um, they're, they're just incredibly cool organisms. Um, do you have a favorite field story or like a, you know, yeah. That is another really great question. Um, 
I have lots of favorite field stories. <laughs> um, one of my favorites, and I'll tell this because it's winter time, and, and where I live, it's it's very cold and snowy today. So I uh, had to do some field work in northern Minnesota in December. Um, this was several years ago with some colleagues of mine. Um, and so the high temperature for the day was like four degrees above zero Fahrenheit. Um, the wind chill was well below zero Fahrenheit. Um, so for Celsius, we're talking about well, well below zero, probably negative 20s kind of range. And um, it was December, so it was really short daylight hours. So we had to be up and in the field like as soon as the sun came up and we spent the whole day in the field, as soon as the sun goes down, you know, pack up and head home. Um, and it was so cold. And we were taking these cores out of uh, a peat bog. Um, and what we were measuring, my colleagues and I, we were measuring how these fungi, uh, mycorrhizal fungi particularly, grow and turn over um, dead material in the, in the soil over the year. And so we'd set up this experiment where we put these tubes in the ground, um, these little plastic tubes with some netting so that only fungal hyphae could get through them. Roots and other organisms couldn't. So we were able to just isolate how much fungi grew during that time. And we had to pull these tubes out at several points during the year. So there was like the May sampling and the August sampling and then the December sampling. And somehow I got to draw the straw for the December sampling. Um, and it was the coldest sampling I've ever done. Um, and we had to shovel snow off of the site and find our tubes. Uh, fortunately, we put flags out before the snow fell, so we knew where they were. And then we had to dig them out of the frozen uh, peat bog, which required a uh, machete and some pretty interesting uh, equipment. And we were able to pull those out and then we had to put a new tube in and we had to do this. Um, it took us about two days to get it all done. So that was probably, um, one of the more wild uh, field stories I have. And it was so cold, we couldn't, we weren't staying warm enough doing just our work. So we would take like breaks and do jumping jacks or shovel snow. There's like a boardwalk through the bog. So we shoveled like a mile and a half of boardwalk of snow just to keep ourselves warm during the day. So that was, that was probably a pretty wild field story. Oh my goodness. Speaking of, of field work, um, in this time of COVID, uh, lots of people are worried about their science education because I think that they see, you know, conduct and um, uh, plan and conduct experiments as doing science. But I'm, you know, so probably your field work, right? Um, how much time do you spend uh, doing your field work? Like, that's a really good question. Um, and I work in a job where I do get to do a fair amount of field work. But that being said, I'm still probably. 60 to 70% of my time is um, kind of non-field work. And that can include things like data analysis, uh, writing papers, um, writing things like uh, this big global uh, biodiversity report. Um, it's a lot of writing and a lot of sharing because the, the experiments we do are only meaningful if we can share that work with, with other people. So, um, I do a lot of writing. Um, I do things like this. I give presentations. I try to uh, reach out and help people understand how cool soil biodiversity is, get people excited about it. We need more people studying this stuff, um, getting involved with it and getting um, being excited about it. Um, so yeah, so I would say the field component of my work is probably 30, 40% of my time. Um, the rest of it is uh, communicating and planning. Um, field work takes a fair amount of planning as well. So I'm kind of keeping all that running. Nice. So uh, um, how, so this is, this is one of the things that I know teachers across the region are, are trying to collect, it, it, telling our students how important evidence is. How important is it to scientists to collect evidence? And then the follow-up to people often is the concern for bias. So sure. how do scientists work through bias and evidence? Yeah, this is really great questions. And it's something that um, like everybody, we were actively discussing and paying attention to and trying to get better at every, every time uh, we do this. So yeah, evidence is hugely important and data is hugely important. And I'll also just to kind of bridge from the last question, there's ways that scientists work with data that don't require going to the field to collect that data. In fact, one of the projects I started this year because of COVID is a project where I'm pulling data from other publications where scientists have shared their data 
and we're putting that all together to look at are are these are the results of these studies consistent across lots of different studies or are they different and so this gets to that question of how do we think about bias and how do we think about what that evidence is telling us um, the thing about scientific experiments is uh, we may get one result in one place, but we may get a slightly different result in someplace else. And in ecology where I work, there's just so many factors that contribute to those outcomes. That's, that's really normal in our field. So we're always looking at what our colleagues, our other scientists are doing and the results they're getting. And sometimes they contradict the results that I get or the results that my other colleagues get. And sometimes there's a good reason for that. Um, maybe this experiment happened in Kansas and this experiment happened in Ohio and they're just, they're different because those systems are really different. Or sometimes um, it's because the way this experiment was set up was a little bit different. And the point is we can learn things from all of that evidence. The trick is we have to kind of put it all out in front of us. I like to think of this metaphorically like a bunch of index cards where I'm like, all right, this group found this and this group found this and this group found this. And what we're looking for is, is what I call like a consistent signal. Are we seeing that in a lot of these studies, we see this response pretty consistently? Or are we seeing just really different kinds of responses? In which case we may, there may be a question we haven't asked that we should be asking. And that gets to that bias too. Scientists are always challenging each other and challenging our thoughts and our conclusions. And that's how science works. Uh, we're always asking questions. And so part of my job is to always be critical and to ask those questions of my colleagues in a constructive and, and kind way, um, and for them to ask that of me. So a really important thing is to look at the evidence around us, look at the evidence that's been published, um, look for trends and ask questions that haven't been asked before. And that's where we go out into the field and collect new evidence or more evidence to help understand that. Excellent. So um, going back to YouTube, um, I think because you've got the prairie picture behind you. Oh, yes. Uh, which ecosystem is your favorite to study? Uh, definitely the tall grass prairie. I, uh, I am a scientist who's very motivated by a particular ecosystem. And the tall grass prairie um, is definitely my favorite ecosystem. I, I grew up in the area where the tall grass prairie is. It's kind of my home habitat, so to speak. Uh, and most of my scientific work has been based in that ecosystem. And in fact, that's uh, very much my job now with the Nature Conservancy, um, where I work, Nachisa Grasslands is a 4,000 acre prairie restoration preserve. Uh, we're always actively um, restoring prairie, um, make, uh, helping the prairie that's here be better. Um, and that's where I do the bulk of my field work. And, um, science question asking. All right. There are um, these cross-cutting concepts that um, teachers across the United States are, are using and trying to implement with students. And it's so funny because listening to your presentation, I think more than any of the other presentations I've, I've been listening to for the teaching, actually, I find evidence for every single, you work in all seven of the cross-cutting concepts. So it's actually hard to ask you a question because you use all of them. So let me just try I'd to like to say I wear a lot of hats. Uh, sometimes they fall off, but I do try to wear a lot of hats. <laughs> well, in your work, um, do you think you rely most on identifying patterns or do you think you rely most in, you know, energy, the flow of, flow of energy and matter? Or do you think you look more at stability and change? You know, which of those three do you think you spend most of your time in? And maybe is there a favorite of those? Gosh, I so like you said, I work in all of those things. And to me, they're all very integrated. Um, and that's part of what I love about being an ecologist um, in ecology. We're always looking at ways things are interacting with each other. So we're looking for patterns, as I talked about with like comparing evidence and thinking about are these uh, patterns consistent or are they different? And if they're different, are there other questions that might help us get at that? Um, but I'm also through my soils work, uh, very interested in energy matter and flows because to me, the interactions between all of these organisms, the product of those interactions of that ecology is things like nutrient cycling and carbon cycling. And that completely relates to things like 
water quality and climate change mitigation. And I dip my toe in all of those pools because it's related. Um, and in fact, one of the big points I really try to make with soil and soil biodiversity is that it's a really holistic starting point. So we don't have to break things down into different categories. When we're thinking about soil biodiversity and how it's all interrelated, all of a sudden we realize that that information, that knowledge, those actions, they actually impact across all of these uh, areas. And so instead of trying to take each of these areas and break them down individually, we can actually step back and think about soil and their interactions and realize these are patterns that are leading to energy flows um, that are, you know, impacting natural systems as well as human systems, and it, it's all connected through the soil. So um, that's part of why I got into working with soil. That's really fired me up as a student, that I could think about all of those things in the same place. I, um, what, in listening to you talk, I now selfishly have another question. Are you, so CO2 sequestering is huge right now. Yeah. And most people are looking for technologies that transfer it to the soil. Do you have any concerns about that? Yeah, so there's, this, this is a really great question and it is huge. And it was one that I just didn't get into in this particular talk. Um, so there's a couple of ways to think about pulling carbon dioxide into the soil. And one of those routes, which you mentioned, is a very technology-oriented route, um, using engineering uh, to do that. Um, but there's also another route, which is actually just leveraging the biology, the plants. Um, interestingly enough, plants are a machine that take carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis, and they turn it into things like leaves and stems and roots. And some of this stuff you know, persists for centuries if we're thinking about big long-lived trees and such. And then that winds up in soil through roots and through decomposition. And in the soil, that debris can sometimes persist for decades or even centuries. And so my research tends to focus more on that biological pathway. And what we know about that biological pathway is it's a very low risk approach to sequestering carbon. Um, we, there aren't a lot of negative consequences of it. It's just leveraging ecosystems working the way they already work. Um, now, you don't necessarily have as much potential to pull carbon quickly out of the atmosphere with that route. But uh, when we're really thinking about climate change, we really have to think about um, putting a lot of options on the table. And that biological process is a really low risk option on that table. So it's one I really strongly advocate for. The engineering options are also a really important tool on the table, and that's not as much my area of expertise, so I never, I don't want to overstep uh, my, <laughs> my knowledge here. Uh, someone else understands the engineering part of that better. Those can be really important tools, but we also have to recognize there's some risk with those, and some of that is our understanding of how um, that, how long that carbon really stays underground or in the soil, and how long that can persist. Um, and if it really winds up where we think it does. And so um, that I would categorize as another really important climate mitigation option on the table. We should be looking into those options, um, but I would say it's maybe a little bit higher risk than um, the biological approach. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just understanding those um, differences. Okay. Understanding, being able to understand the risk and yeah, and, yeah the payoff, yeah. Um, okay, so the Yesterday was International Day of Women and Girls in Science, and every day is, of course, International Day of and all of those who identify, right, women and girls. Um, and so my question for you is, who was young Elizabeth Bach, and, and how did you end up here? That is a lovely question. Um, I will say, as, as a young child, kind of third, fourth grade, I discovered Marie Curie and was just entranced. Uh, she was really my science hero um, from a young age and dressed up for her as Halloween for Halloween and that sort of thing. And, and that really led me into this world of chemistry and really wanting to like be mixing things at the bench and seeing those reactions, that laboratory work that we so often think of as science. Um, and as I went to college and started exploring that, um, I also discovered this world of biology. And what I found was soil biology was actually all of the chemistry I was excited about from my chemistry classes, but it was all happening by living organisms 
And it was literally the reactions that keep life on earth moving forward. And that was just my hook and I have not let go since then. Um, so yeah, I came to this by um, having a little bit of spark of inspiration, but also keeping an open mind and checking out some opportunities that I may not have thought of, you know, young Elizabeth probably wouldn't have thought about. I love that answer. I love that answer. I'm going to um, see, I don't see any questions in the q and I I don't see any questions on YouTube. So I think you, um, you've answered everyone's questions thus far. Great, great. Um, I will tell you that um, Elizabeth is super active on Twitter, and I know I've sent her questions before <laughs> and asked her for data for a class or research for a class. So um, for sure, you can send any follow-up questions you might have um, to her that way. She's, um, she's wonderful. And um, uh, I just want to thank you. I'm going to turn my camera on. Um, I just want to sincerely thank you for taking your time to do this again with us this year, and um, I hope you'll join us again next year. And uh, it was, just, it was great. It was so much fun talking to you today. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciated being here. Thank you to everybody who tuned in. And yeah, I wish you all um, good health, um, safety. Um, we're, yeah, just be well. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I appreciate you. Until next time. All right. Till next time. Bye. Bye.